The Dead Sea Scrolls are famous for the impact that they've had on our modern Bibles. Yet the story of the scrolls is also becoming infamous more recently for the reality of forgeries. So what are these forged fragments? Where do they come from? And then most importantly, how do we recognize them when we see them? In this vlog, we're gonna look at just five features that scholars are using to try to sort out the real old school Qumran goodies for the more recent fake forgeries. The original Dead Sea Scrolls discoveries from the late 40s and early 1950s are kept in a number of museums. Two in Jerusalem, the Israel Antiquities Authority and the Shrine of the Book, as well as a few that are still kept in Jordan. Now, more recently, since around 2002, there's been a sudden surge of new fragments available for sale on a black or gray market of antiquities dealers. Now, the question is, just how new are these fragments? There are five major collectors, universities, or private collections around the world that have bought up these fragments and that have either published them or are on their way to publishing them or have them as part of their exhibition. Now, the majority of these are in America. Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C., Azusa Pacific University down in L.A., as well as two collections in Texas, one at the Lanier Theological Library in Houston and another in Fort Worth, Texas at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. The other major collection is a collection of Martin Scullion in Norway. Now, of these materials, two of them, Museum of the Bible and the Scullion Collection, have published their, their scroll fragments, or at least most of them and either in the process or afterwards have started to ask questions about, are these texts authentic or are they fake? And long story short, teams working on both of these collections have found that while some of them are authentic, many, more than we expected, are in fact forged. Now in the comments section below or in the description below, I'll leave links to a couple of amazing new articles by scholarly teams that are working around these collections, talking about the advanced scientific methods that they've used to identify forgeries among those collections. But what I want to get at here is five features that don't have to do with anything in terms of advanced scientific approaches. They have to do with studying scribal culture, material quality of manuscripts, and text criticism. And these are things that you and I can do if you know a little bit of Hebrew, Greek, or Aramaic, or even if you don't at all, just using some of our basic sense of observation. So we're gonna look at these, and we're not gonna look at any specific fragments, but rather we'll talk about trends or features that seem to be suggesting that some of these fragments are either forgeries or simply just too fishy to bother with. One of the features that we see on a surprising number of these new fragments has to do with the way the text is written, cramped text. And what I mean by that is words or phrases or characters that are squished together with very limited or uneven spaces in between them. We also see that a number of these fragments have unequal tilt of characters or as well as material that's written as if kind of on a roller coaster line. Now, all of these features seem to suggest that the writing on these materials was tailor-made to a certain size and shape of fragment that was already in existence. So think of it this way as a modern example. You and I use post-it notes. We take notes, we leave notes, we write down things we don't want to forget. But what happens when you run out of space before you've completed your sentence? Chances are what you, are, what you and I are gonna do is we're gonna squish the text. We're gonna make sure we get everything we wanna say on that fragment before we run out of space. That's one of the things that we see on a number of these modern potential forgeries. Again, it's not out of the question that we could see some oddities in our scribal culture on an authentic fragment, but what we see is a surprising number of them seem to have this feature of cramped text where a scribal hand or a modern hand is trying to make the most of the space they have available to them. A second feature we see on a number of these fragments is what we might call ink bleed. An ink bleed is what happens when you take new ink and write it on an old surface. 
One of the problems with these fragments is they seem to be written on ancient pieces of leather or papyrus. And that's why carbon dating really does nothing for us in this case. Yet some of the fragments seem to have this feature of that old porous fragment of, again, either leather or papyrus, that when the ink is put on it, it seeps into those pores and the ink bleeds outside of the frame of the characters. So one of the ways you can imagine this is perhaps if we have like an old newspaper or an old book. Now, if you have an old book or an old newspaper, you know the feel of the paper is just different. It's more porous. The pores kind of open up as the material ages. Now imagine taking a Sharpie, a Sharpie marker of, with ink and writing on that page. What are you gonna see happen? You're gonna see the ink bleed outside of the kind of frame of the space that you're trying to write within. That's exactly what we see happen on a number of these fragments, is old fragments and new ink, and the ink bleeds out. That's almost always a telltale sign that something fishy is going on in this new, alleged old Dead Sea Scrolls fragment. Ancient Jewish scribes typically wrote their materials on different types of leather or papyrus. And if you've ever seen papyrus, you know that it's made out of reeds. One set of reeds is put down vertically, the other set horizontally, and then when they're squished together, a natural kind of glue seeps out of those reeds, and suddenly you get this very rigid and long-lasting writing surface that we call papyrus. Now, if you're writing on that surface, most ancient Jewish scribes and most ancient scribes across the ancient Near East would have known to write with the grain. Otherwise, when you write against the grain, you get this awkward, bumpy material surface that does not make for an exactly clean copy of whatever it is you're writing. Now, statistically, there's a very limited, a very low amount of material from the ancient world on papyrus written across the grain, and that's called transversa carta. Now, what we find, however, is a number of these materials, these new Dead Sea Scrolls that are written on papyrus, statistically there are more of them that are written transversa carta across the grain than there are that we find in other collections of papyri from the ancient world. On its own, that means that this is not a feature that would be a knockout factor to suggest something is a forgery, but it would be one more box that we'd want to check to see if there are just too many fishy or suspicious features on one of these fragments to suggest it's authentic. So when we think about the material quality, it's not just the words on the page, it's also the character and quality of the manuscript and the way that that ancient scribe or modern hand was interacting with it. Our fourth odd feature that we find on many of these fragments of biblical texts is how they relate to or reveal what seem like brand new readings, new words or phrases for the text critical study of the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. Now on closer inspection, what we find is many of these are new to us, but if you do a little digging, they are readings that have been proposed before in modern scholarship. What we find is that there are a number of these readings that come from the footnotes of either now vintage commentaries from the 19, early 1900s, where scholars would suggest maybe the text read this and would present the Hebrew text, or from the footnotes, the critical apparatus of earlier editions of the Hebrew Bible, like Biblia Hebraica Kittel or Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia. Down at the bottom of the page, scholars have developed notes that would suggest that perhaps the text read this or should read this, and quite often we find is these fragments authenticate those readings. Suddenly we have a fragment that does confirm that scholarly hunch was correct. Now, the problem is, this happens a little too often in this data set. And if we step back from these alleged Dead Sea Scrolls, we would see that this is actually a feature that's not uncommon of many other modern forgeries that relate to the biblical text. For example, the so-called Gospel of Jesus' Wife that was made famous in 2012, and then quickly we realized that it was a forgery. The text that was written on that fragment did something similar. It drew on material from an earlier edition of the Gospel of Thomas that we know from the Nag Hammadi collection. So we find in that example, as well as a number of these examples from these so-called Dead Sea Scrolls, is these new readings have almost a vintage flavor. And if we do our homework, what we find is they're readings that seem to be drawn from 
earlier scholarly proposals in either the footnotes and critical apparatus of editions or in the discussion of now older vintage throwback commentaries on biblical books. Our fifth and final feature has to do with the unusually high number of biblical fragments among these private collections, as well as the types of passages that are reflected on these fragments. They're theologically significant or theologically loaded for a certain type of Christian audience. Now, if we stand back and look at the Dead Sea Scrolls collections that we already knew about from the 40s and 50s, about 23% of those materials are biblical writings. And what I mean by that is they're writings that are later received as biblical in Judaism and Christianity in the Hebrew Bible and the Old Testament. Yet when we look at these private collections, we take them all together and run the numbers, we get a much higher figure. Around 90% of these fragments represent materials that are from biblical passages. Yet, as I said, they're not just any old biblical passages. There's a surprising concentration of significant or theologically significant passages. For example, of the five collections we're talking about, all but one, Lanier Theological Library, include copies or fragments of Daniel. Now, Daniel's significant for early Christian theology, particularly significant for contemporary evangelical theology. We also find passages like Leviticus 18. Leviticus 18 to 20 is a very controversial set of passages because of how it relates to or is brought into conversations on what the Bible says about homosexuality. We also see a number of other fragments that have significant passages. For example, Psalm 22. Psalm 22 is one of the passages that we find in the New Testament that the gospel writers say that Jesus uttered his last words on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, on its own, again, this might not be enough to suggest these fragments are fake. But what I want to impress upon you here is that we take not just the scientific approach, which can be a very helpful strategy for debunking or identifying these fragments, but we can also look at scribal textual material qualities. And if it was just one of these features, we would perhaps let it go. But the surprising concentration of a number of these features on singular fragments, as well as across the larger collection, suggests we should pause and ask some really critical questions. Because if we have authentic scrolls that impact scripture, that's an amazing opportunity. If we're studying the Bible as an academic text, then we want to make sure the data is also preserved. Yet if we have forgeries in the mix, it compromises both of those things, not just theologically or academically, but even ethically. So as we look at new discoveries, whether the Dead Sea Scrolls or any other artifacts related to the ancient world, we should always be asking the questions of where did it come from? Provenance. Is it authentic? And then also chain of custody. How did we get to know this material? How did it go from a discovery into a modern collection. And if we can answer all of those questions sufficiently, then we can draw on these materials in a responsible and ethical way. Well, thanks for joining me on this Forgeries episode of Inscribed. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel. I've got some amazing things planned for 2020 and I want you to be part of it. Also, if you have questions or comments about the content, let me know in the comments section. I'll do my best to get back to you. Otherwise, thanks for being here. We'll see you next time on Inscribed. Ah, where did my Sharpie go?